As a wildlife vet, I get to meet and examine lots of exotic species. But I gotta say, my favorite animal is still that tail wagging wonder, Canis lupus familiaris, the good old domesticated dog. This cutie is Eva. She lives on San Juan Island with her humans, Deb Giles and Jim Rappold. Giles is a PhD who has devoted her entire career to studying one particular kind of marine mammal. With such an intense focus, it's no wonder that Giles' research has become a family affair. And after specialized training, Eba has become a professional working dog with one of the coolest jobs on the planet. Today, I'm giving Eba a routine checkup to make sure she's ready to go for her important mission. Okay, so how old is Eba, Giles? Um, we don't know for sure. Um, she's a rescue, so based on what we learned from the shelter, uh, we think around seven. Okay, so she's a rescue dog. That's cool. Yeah, and looking at her teeth. Eva was abandoned as a puppy, a but happily, she found her forever home here in 2017. Okay, Giles, eyes look good, body condition's good, heart sounds great. She's ready to work. Awesome. <laughs> Yay, you hear that? Many work? dogs get anxious Let's around veterinarians because we're always poking and prodding them. Eva is clearly furious with me after the exam, and she'll never forgive me. She finishes my face wash just as Giles gets an alert from a naturalist out on the water. It's go time. Eva wasn't bred for this. She's an all-American mutt, a shelter dog who is just Giles' fuzzy buddy until a trainer suggested she had the right personality and drive to become a detection dog. With their legendary smelling skills and trainability, canines are invaluable for jobs like detecting explosives, finding lost people, and even sniffing out diseases such as cancer and diabetes. But Eba was adopted by a biologist who happens to be the research director of Wild Orca. That twist of fate means that the job of this rescue pup is to help rescue an endangered species. Aboard Wild Orca's customized research vessel, Eba relaxes, safely tucked into her first-class cabin. Orcas have been spotted across the border in Trincomalee Channel, so we set course for the Canadian Gulf Islands. Sea-Doc is on board with the Wild Orca team and Hendrick Nolans, a veterinarian with the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. As soon as we get within about a half a mile of the last killer whale sighting, Eba clocks in for work up on the boat's carpeted bow. While Eba can certainly smell the orcas themselves, it's not her job to locate them. That would be too easy. She's got a much harder assignment, finding what the killer whales leave behind, something scientists call scat, and everyone else calls poop. Okay, Jow, so here we are in your office, in Eba's office, we've got whales behind us. Tell us how this works. How do you get her up here? How, do we, how does she know that she's on the job now? Uh, well, as soon as Eva's on the bow, she knows she's working. Okay. And quite honestly, it's as soon as this vest goes on. And then how, do, how will you position the boat around the whales? So this is a non-invasive program. We uh, like to stay as far away as possible. With Eva's superpowers, we can be up to a nautical mile away. Generally, we're about 400 meters behind the whales and to the side and uh and in a perfect world we're a 90 degree angle to the wind so that the wind will come across the sample the scent will be picked up by the wind and come across to us detection school teaches the dog to alert her handler when she smells whatever she's been trained to find that, that right? could be the scent of a child lost in the woods or killer whale poop in the open sea and dogs can find these odor molecules even when they're diluted down to a few parts per trillion. And how will she behave when she actually smells the sample? How will you know she's on the sample? She, uh, her alert, so every dog is different, but Eva's alerts are that she gets very stiff. Okay. Suddenly she just goes like stiff as a board. And then she'll, it's like she's thinking about it and trying to figure out where the smell is coming from. And then she does this thing I call sniffing up the air where she literally will go, all right. And it kind of reminds me of Pepe Le Pew. Right, like, yeah. yeah. I got something. And then as soon as she's locked on to where that sit, the strongest scent is coming from, she will go to that part of the boat, and her nose will stay as uh, kind of trained on that, uh, the, the thickest part the, uh, of, the, of the scent. 
And then we're just literally following her nose at that point. Yeah, I love this because, you know, even 20 or 30 years ago when, when I first started working in the field, we had to capture animals, we had to take blood samples, we had to use probes and things like that. And now all of this can be done with minimal disturbance to the wild animals. And Absolutely. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. You are a hero, little girl. You're magic. Yes, you are. Well, should we get to work? Yeah, let's do it. A killer whale surfaces. The enormous dorsal fin instantly tells us that this is a mature male. We go through an ID checklist. This guy has a solid color saddle patch behind a blunt tip dorsal fin with three distinct notches. He's definitely T46D, a big boy nicknamed Strider who was born in 2000. His family are designated the T46s, named for their leader, Strider's mom, who's also known as Wake. In 1976, Wake became famous as one of the last killer whales to be captured in the United States. Thankfully, public outrage led to her release before they could ship her off to an aquarium. Since then, Wake has gone on to have at least five calves, nine grand calves, and two great grand calves. She's now in her mid-50s and still going strong. The T in this pod's official name stands for transient killer whales, who we now commonly call bigs, in honor of Dr. Michael Burke, a pioneering orca researcher. Bigs and southern residents are classified as separate ecotypes, which means they've adapted differently over hundreds of thousands of years. In the case of West Coast killer whales, the most notable distinction between our three ecotypes is diet. Southern residents eat fish, while bigs are mammal eaters, who primarily hunt seals, sea lions, and porpoises. Biggs killer whales are at the very top of the marine food web. So this is like seeing lions on the African plain. If lions were 25 feet long and weighed 15,000 pounds, even though they're not southern residents, getting a fecal sample from these orcas would be incredibly valuable. Because they're apex predators, it would not only give us a window into their individual health, but would also be a view of the health of the entire Salish Sea ecosystem. But this is a big challenge for Eba's nose. She's principally trained to find scat from fish-eating orcas. Will she even be able to find a sample from animals with a completely different diet? To make it even more difficult, bigs travel in much smaller groups than residents. This is a large stretch of water with just five orca who may or may not have to go to the bathroom this afternoon. You gotta love a dog's enthusiasm, whether it's for chasing a frisbee or finding free-range poop. So it looks like Eva is on to something now. She just jumped up from her seat. She's at the front of the bow now and she's sniffing back and forth. I can't smell anything, but she's on to something. Giles signals to Jim, who steers the boat into position. It's no surprise that Eva is picking up a scent that I can. Research shows that in general, a canine's olfactory system is somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 times more sensitive than a human's. Most of the fragrances we can detect better than dogs come from fruits and flowers, which makes sense for us as omnivores. Fortunately for this kind of conservation work, feces ain't flowers. Dogs descended from wolves who made their living as true carnivores, just like the big killer whales. To hunt for these samples, Eba is drawing on all of her species' evolutionary adaptations that give them such amazing olfactory abilities. Even her internal nasal architecture is adapted to suit an animal that sees the world in high-def 3D smell -o vision When Eba sniffs, the inhaled air splits into two streams. Most goes towards her lungs, but part is channeled into a special olfactory chamber in the back of her nose where it lingers. This gives hundreds of millions of odoreceptors extra time to process the chemical molecules in the air sample, and it makes Eba a four-legged laboratory. Eba is sniffing up a symphony of smells out here. Engine exhaust, kelp drying on faraway beaches, the roast beef sandwich I have in my pocket, and lots more. Out of this airborne potpourri, she needs to pick out the faintest whiff of orca poop. And there it is. Eba's talented nose and some great teamwork brings us right alongside two samples. 
It's good. Hendrick Good scoops them up. Let her run in. Little wake, come in here. Port side, little wake. Giles immediately starts processing in the boat's cool little lab at the stern. The bulk of the material gets put onto ice to be shipped out for analysis, while we also make microscope slides right here in the field. And so what we're doing now, Hendrick is making some slides to look at under the microscope. We're also using a culturette so we can get aerobic and anaerobic bacterial cultures. And these are the sorts of things that will tell us a lot about the health of these animals. DNA can identify the individual. Hormone levels can determine stress and whether a female's pregnant. And we can look for things that might negatively affect the orca or its entire population. Of special concern for killer whales are man-made forever compounds like PCBs and some pesticides, water repellents, and fire retardants. These persistent chemicals accumulate as they move up the food chain. Predators at the top and just the pollutants that all the animals and plants below them have stored in their tissues. This is a threat to all orcas. However, when killer whales are finding plenty of food, the pollutants do less damage to their health. Right now, the bigs have lots of seals and other marine mammals to eat in the Salish Sea. Female bigs like Wake keep on pumping out healthy calves and their population is growing at a very impressive 4.1%. For the critically endangered southern residents who struggle to find enough Chinook salmon, their cousins, the thriving bigs, are a beacon of hope. If we can recover the salmon, we can recover the southern residents. After a long day on the water, our reward is doing science that can play a crucial role in killer whale conservation. For Eva, the reward is well-deserved playtime with a ratty old rope and lots of praise from her fellow girl. field researchers. That's a good girl. You've got to love dogs. Yeah. <laughs> And has, has she ever fallen over or jumped overboard or anything? Nope, nope, never given us any reason to think that she wants to. Because so. I love when she's out there, she's got her paw, she's looking down. I, I would tumble over three or four times a day. Yep. It's better to have a dog on the job than a Joe on the job. Try to catch me howling at the moon. This is Joe Gatos of the Sea Doc Society. Thanks for watching. Click over here to check out more episodes of Salish Sea Wild. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you can join Team Sea Doc on all our adventures. Thank you.